I'm going to speak today about reinforcement learning. This is going to be a talk about reinforcement learning, and I'm planning on giving you a basic overview. So if you already know about the topic, this is really just going to be running through the fundamentals of what it is and trying to give you something that you can use to Thing I typically like to do with certain concepts that are very popular and also seem slightly complex and are complex. So to diff tell you a little bit about myself, I am a developer advocate who works for Google, and I specifically focus on Google Cloud and machine learning and AI, sometimes together, sometimes separately. My background is from implementing machine learning algorithms in production, and I have been doing that, or I did that with change.org for a little while. And then I worked on an open source neural net platform building out, and I, I love it, I'm seeing chat and all the hellos. But anyway, uh, worked on an open source platform building out um, a neural net platform that was Java based. And so now, as I said, working as an advocate, talking about AI and talking about GCP. And for today, I'm gonna specifically focus on RL. Reinforcement learning, what it is at its heart is fundamentally what it sounds like. You're in essence trying to create something and use a goal, give a reward in order to influence that direction. And in this case, we're talking about software. We're trying to build out software and influence its direction based on that goal. And let me also take a moment and, and stress that reinforcement learning is an algorithm or a set of algorithms that is in the overall machine learning space of algorithms. Now, I'm assuming those who are listening to this talk already know about machine learning. I'll take a second to mention that machine learning in particular is a uh, number of algorithms that are used for pattern recognition and prediction, and there's a good number of resources out there that can help give you more information around this. Reinforcement learning is one of the more complex algorithms in the space, and you know it shares the space with deep learning as well. All right, so reinforcement learning, to really kind of dive into it, I think it's useful to focus on, as I mentioned, you know, its drive is around getting a good reward. And when you talk about it, typically people will talk about games. They'll say games, you know, bring up game examples as a way to uh, provide examples of the space. TD Gammon is a game that was developed by Gerald uh, Tesaro back in the 1992. And this was a game that was you know, designed to beat humans. And what was interesting about it is that it was built on reinforcement learning. It's one of the first sort of well-known examples that were successful. What's interesting is not that it was able to be as good, if not slightly better than humans at the game, is what that it was that it was able to find approaches and ways to win the game that a human wouldn't have necessarily considered. And cut to last year, we have DeepMind's AlphaGo, which is another game that was successful in terms of beating uh, one of the larger or well-known uh, grandmasters in the space, Lisa Dahl. And it is also a computer program that was built on reinforcement learning techniques in order to be successful at winning. But what was most interesting was the fact that it would take these steps, it would take these actions that were uh, ways to play the game that a human would have you know, not considered before, but those hits, losses it would take were ones that allowed it to get greater gains. So it's, it's able to help us sh help show behaviors and actions to take that you wouldn't have necessarily realized could feed into a larger win at the end of the day. Now games, games is what we talk about when we talk about reinforcement learning and it's funny because I know that sometimes when you hear it, you're thinking it's not, doesn't seem like it's as incredible or as credible as it could be. It, it's fun and fanciful, you know, but really what's the real practical applications of it? And there are practical applications. The reality is that games are the easiest way to explore the space. They're very contained and it allows you to easily determine, especially with this algorithm, that it's successful and see how it's successful. But as I said, you do have practical applications. And uh, Google actually took some of DeepMind's approaches in reinforcement learning and applied it. We've applied it internally to analyze the uh, energy use in our data centers. And we were able to reduce our cooling energy use by 40%, which is huge. So companies are exploring reinforcement learning from a standpoint of how do we apply this in a way to 
you know, drive uh, more efficient operations, to drive improved revenues. You know, it's looking at ultimately saying, what is our problem as it is defined by a goal? And let's see if we can explore the environment that is in that problem space to get the most, to make the most optimal path and improve upon uh, the kind of rewards, whatever that reward is, so that we, you know, can increase costs, whatever it is we're going to drive after. But you have to be able to have a goal and an environment in which you're operating. And you can turn so many things into this. So that's great, but it's not easy. This space is very, it seems so simple when you talk about it initially, but it is uh, very complex to achieve. And it's also uh, fraught with of you need a lot of data, typically a lot more data than you do with, you know, when you're working with the neural net space, uh, and time, time to fully explore. And to help you better understand that, I'm going to spend some time now really sort of stepping through some of the fundamentals of what it is. So at its heart, we have these core components. And really, these two pieces, the environment and the agent, are, are your two main actors in the space. Now, the agent is what you get to control, and the environment is in what, what you're exploring. The agent has a specific state in which it will exist in the environment, and usually a set of actions that it can take to get to the next state, or, what, or next states, depending on what the options look like. And ultimately, as I said, and I think you're really getting the, the gist of this, is that you're going after a reward, you're going after some type of objective. The other component to keep in mind is that you have to take into consideration horizon or time. So your time is uh, dependent on how long it takes to get to the reward. Sometimes it takes one step and you get to the reward. Sometimes it's a combination of multiple, multiple steps uh, and you don't always necessarily find a direct path to that reward. So those are, those are the core components to be aware of. Now, the agent itself, as I mentioned, this is what you control. And what you're controlling in the agent is its behavior. And you're defining what are the optimal actions and the optimal policies for it to take based on whatever state that it's in. The environment that you operate in, whenever you hear anybody talk about the environment, you're usually hearing them say MDP. Uh, Commonly, this is what comes up. That we're, we're exploring the space, we're getting the most optimal re reinforcement learning algorithm for this MDP. And you're basically trying to um, satisfy the markup property. That's what the MDP means, or markup decision process means. Seems simple enough. For those math majors out there, you may understand this. Uh, but markup property and ultimately the markup decision process, what it is basically telling you is that based on the state you are in right now, that is all you need to know in that current state to determine what you're going to do next and determine what the value is for what you will do in the next several states forward to get to the reward. So that's what they're talking about. There's uh, more complexity, of course, to this, but in the essence of time, I'm going to be doing a lot of simplification up, uh, across the board. So your environment, your MDP is what you work in, and you have these fundamental components, the transition function and the reward. And sometimes you don't know anything about your environment, but usually you'll have some understanding or some inkling of what it's going to look like. And the transition function in this case is this mapping of how you get from one state to the next or how you get from one state action pair to the next. This is not your behaviors. This is the environment determining how likely you are to move into certain states. So, you know, if I was standing in front of a door and I opened the door, maybe based on the environment itself, there's a 50 foot chance I'd be able to move through that door or not, or that the door would even open actually. Um, so transition function helps define the environment. And the reward function, of course, defines what the reward is. Within the state actions that the uh, actor uh, we'll be able to take a take. You can think about mapping these out into some type of search tree. So with the search tree, uh, the search tree is really you have a number of states and you have your corresponding actions. And I've got a very simplistic perspective here where within, you know, one action you get one state that's a follow-on. Uh, but a lot of times it could be multiple. 
And a great example of this is looking at something like a MINAX tree. Um, and I'm using this explicitly to help you think about state action pairings or state action exploration is when you're mapping it out, you're thinking about it like a tree. You take the game of tic-tac-toe, for example, and you see how it's in its current state of where the players are on the board and what the options are for you versus your opponent and how that will eventually play out to where you finally get some type of uh, result. And that will help you determine what's the best path forward, right? This is great when the state space is fairly small and limited. You can fully map this out. You can exhaustively search it and figure out the best path. But when you start to expand the size of that state space and it gets more and more complex, then you have to use various techniques to figure out the best path forward without fully mapping it out because it's too big to hold in memory. It's too large to fully compute or to fully compute within a reasonable amount of time. So reinforcement learning plays a big role in terms of helping you to explore this search tree in essence to find the optimal path. And if you haven't really figured this out from what I've already said, what you're really trying to drive after with reinforcement learning, sure, you want the most reward, but to get it, you want to find the most optimal policy, the most optimal path and behavior in that path. So it's the overall optimal policy for the full problem. It's also the optimal policy for every single state in which you can exist. And whenever you see any uh, algorithms that are listed, uh, you will see there's a star for optimal and there's a pi for policy. And so those are the basically the symbols that you would regularly see when you're looking at any of the algorithms that are out there. All right, these are the components to give you a sense of how reinforcement learning works. Now let's talk about the functions. There's these core functions that you're going to be working with. And specifically, uh, the core functions fall into these main categories of your model, your value function, and the policy. And so the model itself is uh, really the agent's representation of the environment, while the value function is taking the reward and extrapolating it back so that there's a value associated to every state or every state action pair. And your policy is a way to model the behaviors and to explore those models. For model, what it is, is, as I said, is it's the agents looking at that environment and trying to you know, map it out. And there's a number of ways that you can do a model. Uh, I've got just like three listed here, but you know, there's a number of uh, approaches that you can take. Table is common when you're first starting out. You know, you're just doing sort of the state action pairing and comparison and then figuring out what the rewards are, are um, associated to those pairings. But when you get into a very complex space, you can't use a table. It's just too small. It's, it's not able to fully express everything, especially when you look at continuous environments. When you look at your algorithms for building out your reinforcement learning uh, approach, you have model-based versus model-free. And so with model-based, ultimately, you know, it drives out what's known as planning. You can track how the environment looks and make better decisions off of that. Um, while mo model-free frees you up from having certain assumptions and allows you to explore in a way that might come up with new approaches that you didn't expect. Uh, it also is much better for things that are continuous, that are, full, that are hard to fully uh, explore the search space. So what it ends up looking like is that, you know, you will be trying to figure out what the associated value is to your state, what the policy is for that behavior. You'll, you'll probably guesstimate it at first. You'll take a random action. You'll, you'll be in a state and you'll take a random action and you'll get some experience and you'll determine if that gives you any kind of result. And then you can directly update the approaches you have and the values you've assigned. Um, additionally, or alternatively, you can learn and update the model and make plans off of that model. And so it turns into this thing where you are, you know, either just acting and updating directly your value in your policy or, and or you are learning and trying to track a model and make better decisions off that model. So, you know, if you're exploring a maze, for example, you may go down the same row multiple times without some type of model of it. 
uh, because you didn't know that you've been down that path before. But if you had the model, you could plan accordingly. Many will argue that uh, it's good to have both together. And you'll actually find this is actually a common thing with reinforcement learning. You've got model uh, based and model free, or you've got any kind of alternative paths. They'll explore each one differently, and then they'll combine the two together and say, let's try it together. So you'll see this is a common theme uh, as I go for forward. And just to let you guys know, I do see that there's some questions that are coming up in chat. I have a lot that I'm trying to cover in this time that I have, so I'll circle back to chat when I've got when I get to the end, uh, either during the talk or uh, after the talk. All right, so this is models. Now, what I'm gonna do next is talk about value function, and I'm going to mention the fact that value function is usually when you explore reinforcement learning for the first time, and most of the materials that are out there, they start out with a value function. I've deliberately explained the model, and when I say model, I'm saying, this is the agent's representation of its environment. You'll hear me say model at other times as well, and that's a different thing, but I just want to give you an understanding of, you know, the agent is trying to understand its space. It may try to track it, it may not. It doesn't always. And that's a key thing to understand when you're looking at these algorithms that we want to work with. All right, so value function. So value function is really, like I said, trying to apply some type of value based on the state that the agent currently exists in. Now, it could be just for the state, or it could be a state action pair. And that's where you differentiate between the V and the Q, and you see those in, different, in the different algorithms that are out there. In reinforcement learning, grid world is its kind of hello world, and it's because it's a nice simplified space. You know, you only have nine different um, states that you can exist in that have no actual value associated to it, direct reward associated, and then you have this, uh, these two additional states that have a positive and a negative reward associated, and one state in particular that you can't even really operate in. And as I mentioned, you know, this is the states, these are your rewards, and you've got actions based on the state that you're in that you can take, and you have your transition model that you can um, determine, you know, how likely are you to move into a new state based on the position that you're in, especially like if you've got a wall behind you, maybe there's an 80% chance you're moving forward. Uh, this is slightly random in terms of what was built out, uh, but it's not, you know, it's really to emphasize the fact that uh, this environment in particular, this is the direction you may move in. It's not explicitly your, your behavior. To get to a reinforcement learning model, one way that's very common is this prediction and control mechanism where you are in essence trying to evaluate your policy and update your value uh, and you're constantly exploring the space so you're constantly moving through this grid world and trying out randomly different things to see if you can get to some type of value and then ex exploring it uh, and then basically extrapolating it back and saying, let me update these spaces with that value or some variation off of that value. And I'm just gonna keep randomly exploring and seeing what I get uh, and continually iterating on that and updating to get, and, and to do this, I'm, I'm just you know, predicting. I'm predicting that I think this is a good direction to go in. My control is as I get more information about this environment, then I'm going to act more greedily and I'm going to basically say, pick these directions to go in. So within value functions, the Bellman equation is pretty common. And what it's ultimately doing, as I mentioned, is you know, you're trying to extrapolate uh, some type of value for the current state you're in. It may have no explicit reward at that point. Uh, so it could be zero, or it could be that you finally found the reward and it's going to be a one. Then you want to combine that with all of the potential future rewards you're going to get if you acted optimally. And you want to discount that too, because you may have multiple options in terms of ways to get to the end game. So that's what the value is. That's what your value function looks like. And as you can see, this is why it's an MDP, because it's only looking at the reward and its future rewards. It's not looking at anything that's come before. And the control, as I mentioned, it's about acting greedily. It's about saying, here's my result, here's my value, and I'm finding that my best behavior is X. So that means in this state, I'm always going to take this action. 
The grid world here is showing you just a quick example of where based on whatever position you're in, this is the best policy and the associated value. And these values were really derived from, you know, just an example run through of like nine iterations of exploring the space and the different options. But it really becomes one of those things where um, these values can be not necessarily, there's variance in terms of how you, how these values would be derived. You might not necessarily get the same thing if you explored it yourself. Uh, and that is because of the randomness that's involved in terms of getting to these values. But you're ultimately trying to say, like, what direction should I be moving in and understand that and extrapolate that from the end value that you'll get. So that's the, I don't know, I'm just giving you like the bare bones basics of how to get to a value function. It's this combined prediction and control exploration. It breaks down into these four kind of key areas when you do your ma value methods. Uh, and they are categorized best by looking at whether you are modeling or have a full model of your environment versus you have uh, a number of ways that you're, or how far down you're going to go in the tree search or how far down you can go in the tree search. When you exhaustively search, like I was mentioning early on with um, some of the games like checkers, you know, those have been fully mapped out. So you know the best path because you know all of the options. You've, you've fully mapped out what the rewards are and you know the path to go forward. But that's extremely hard as the spaces get more complex. So one other approach, as we just uh, we're sort of touching on, is dynamic programming, where it's not a huge space you're going to necessarily explore, but it's it's a nice size and you can fully explore it uh, and see what the rewards look like and you can update and easily update. Monte Carlo takes into account the fact that you may not be able to and you may not want to uh, map out the full tree and this is where you would do um, sampling and simulation and you just continually sample over and over and over again but you have to have an episodic space to work in. You have to get to an end, get a re result, and feed that back up into the actual model itself. Well, TD learning is taking the components of dynamic programming in Monte Carlo and combining the two and saying, you know what, I'm just going to sample. I'm also not going to go to the full end before I make updates to my value function. So just to kind of reemphasize what I've covered, you've got your dynamic program, as I mentioned, this is great when you have a small space in which you're trying to assess and you are in essence taking the probability of your transition function, you're combining it with your immediate reward and your future discounted rewards, and you're doing that in every single state. And then you're working with your control and you're saying, now that I have value function uh, results for all of my states, I'm gonna take the max out of that and pick those policies. I'm gonna keep iterating. And you kind of have to decide at which point you're going to stop. Where do you think is a good place to stop um, iterating on this and, and you found the best policies to move forward with? And then a side note. So that's, you know, your value function and you're looking specifically at state values. There's also these Q values where it's combining, as I've mentioned before, the states with actions and you're getting some actual values based on every single state and action pairing. And this equation is roughly kind of what you'll typically see when you're looking at uh, anything around reinforcement learning and value function and the Bellman equation. Um, but it's, you know, there's some variations that you'll see out there, but this at least gives you a sense of where to start. As I mentioned, Car Monte Carlo is used for sampling and simulation. It's great when it's model free, uh, especially when it's hard to model uh, your environment. And it's important that it has to be episodic. And you take your estimated value, you're subtracting it from the actual reward when you get to the end. Uh, and you're just looking at, you know, how often did you come to that state? You know, what's the reward look like in that state? With temporal difference learning, this is where you're combining both Monte Carlo and you're combining it with. Uh, the dynamic programming bootstrapping and the thing to note with temporal difference learning is they have a couple of approaches in terms of the algorithms that are known as off policy versus on policy and off policy is saying that you are continually updating the policy but not necessarily based on the policies that you are working with so it's it's disjointed in terms of i am exploring a policy and i'm making updates but it's not directly to that policy um, 
these approaches really will eventually get you to the results that you're looking for at the end of the day. You're taking the estimated value, you're revising your value, and the value for, let me step back and say, so this, there's a great example, David Silver has some uh, great content out there that gives an overview of reinforcement learning, and he provided an example in there that talks about how, like, you know, you've got a car, you've got, let's say, the self-driving car, and it can see that it's about to hit into, it's about to hit something. Uh, you don't want it to get to the end and hit something. And update its model. You want it to understand that there's a danger and to update the model in process. So ultimately, temporal difference is allowing you to start to explore, see that there's a problem, and make a change before it fully explores the space. Now, one of the off-policy algorithms in temporal difference learning is known as Q-learning, and you've probably heard about this before if you know about reinforcement learning, and this is where Q-learning sits, and it's taking the Q-values and doing uh, this sampling and this bootstrapping without um, necessarily doing a full exploration. With Q-learning, you combine that with neural nets because everything's better with neural nets, and that's where you get deep, deep Q network or DQN. Uh, DeepMind defined this and developed this when they were doing exploration with Atari games. So if you've heard about reinforcement learning in Atari, then what you're hearing about is DeepMind's exploration using DQN. Uh, when they started this out, they were working with a combination of convolutional neural nets and full, uh, full nets, and uh, variations off that have been explored since. Uh, the thing about Q learning, the thing about temporal difference learning is that convergence is hard. So there's a number of techniques that have come up over the, the years that, or over the time that this has been worked on, that are allowing us to drive out uh, better convergence, and some of those known as target networks and experience replay. But ultimately, what you're doing when you are working with a neural net and DQN is that you are feeding in state and actions, or just the states, and you get back some type of Q value. Maybe you get back a Q value for the state action that was fed into the network, or you'll get back a Q value per action for whatever state was passed in. It's, it's roughly the same thing. And as I mentioned, DeepMind used this to play Space Invaders and to play multiple other Atari games, and they were able to come back with some um, bots that basically were better at playing these games than, than what humans have been able to achieve in a number of cases. Uh, and this is just a, one of many videos that they have out there that shows you know, this Atari game once it's been fully trained at being very successful uh, at what it's able to play. And of course, it's identified some approaches that are unique and different from what a human would have necessarily thought of. Okay, so just like Game of Thrones, I am going to now squeeze in the rest of this to the end because I think I'm actually, um, yeah, I've got about 12 minutes left. So policy. Okay, value function is about getting a value and extrapolating a reward back into your state and action pairings or states. And so you're, you're trying to understand the reward function as it relates to every single state that you could potentially exist in. Well, policy is saying, hey, why don't we just model the actual behavior itself? And the reason why we would do this is that there are going to be situations, and I'm also using this example from David Silver's lectures where, you know, let's say you're playing Russian bow or rock, paper, scissors. There are going to be games and situations and problems where it will be extremely difficult to have an explicit value to associate to your actions. And so in those cases, it's better to model the policy. And, and for Russian bow, you know, you can't come up with uh, one hand gesture has a better chance and a better value associated to it because it's a uniform random policy that will be the best policy to play this game. Now, I know there's probably some caveats here, but go with me on this. The value for policy search is that usually it's more efficient in terms of its storage, it's uh, great for continuous environments and high dimensions, um, but it's also fraught with high variance and difficult, uh, it's hard to converge. And I know I've said converge before, and just to make sure we're all on the same pages, it means getting an actual model out of this that uh, will be something you can apply to solve the problem. You know, if it, if it doesn't converge, then it's just random and it's not really giving you any kind of result that you can work with. So, 
baseline and advantage function are two approaches that have been applied. There's always some exploration here to see, like, what if we apply certain techniques that can improve upon that. I don't have time to really go through all of the different algorithms for this, but I've tried to give you like a snapshot of some of the algorithms that you can explore in policy search. And the main thing I want you to take away from this is that they're broken into two main, or they're typically broken into two main areas, which is gradient versus gradient free. Uh, you know, whether you have a model that is allowing you to do derivatives off of your um, derivatives off the gradient versus um, gradient free being more, you know, like a frequency type of thing. One great example, uh, a really good example that I've seen out there is like a starter place to explore po policy gradients is the um, example that Carpathy is a well-known researcher and leader in the space. He's written about, you know, using policy gradients to do Pong and of course combining that with neural nets because as I said, everything's better with neural nets. Um, but, you know, it's really, it takes the image, it breaks it into the, a bunch of pixels and, and passes it through some, a neural net and you've got your environment is situated where you've got one um, is run by, it, one of the paddles is being run by the neural net and figuring out the best reactions to take. And the actions are up or down. That's, that's your neural net's model. It's does it go up or does it go down based on the, the uh, pixels that you're feeding it. I've played this on a server that I spun up. Uh, in the first couple of days, it was really losing. But by the third day, it was starting to show that it was doing actually some level of result by the uh, getting some type of wins. And by the fourth day, it was definitely winning on a regular basis. And then on the fifth day, it died. Uh, I would recommend checking this out. It's a simple one to get going with. But yeah, that's, that's an example of a policy uh, neural net. All right. As I mentioned, reinforcement learning, we like to combine all the things together. You know, you come up with the different options and then you say, let's bring it together and try it together. So you've got a value function, you've got a policy model, why don't we do both? And that's where you get asynchronous advantage actor critics. So A3C, also sometimes known as A2C if you drop off the asynchronous part. But what you do is you combine the value function as the critic that's helping to evaluate your policy and estimate your value. And you apply whatever the critic score is to the score of the policy gradient neural net model. And that helps you update what your policy should look like. So the actor says, I'm going to take these different actions, starting out randomly. The critic tells you if it's looking like that's actual got any type of reward value to it. You take that and apply that back into the actor, and the actor decides to take maybe new direction. It, apply, it adjusts its model accordingly, and you just keep iterating. And the asynchronous part is that you do this in parallel. You have multiple agents and multiple copies of the environment exploring, and then you will bring it back together into, into a final uh, model that you can apply. The real drive here is to speed up how quickly you can get to a reinforcement learning model that will be useful. Uh, DeepMind in the beginning had explored this with this labyrinth uh, game and trying to get the uh, bot that's moving through the labyrinth, it's a first person viewer, uh, to get apples in essence. And it was very successful in terms of how quickly it was able to learn to find the apples. So that's just a quick example. There's others that are out there for sure that's uh, explored more thoroughly. Those are the key functions that I wanted you to see. I wanted you to really understand from a reinforcement learning perspective. As I mentioned, you may or may not know your environment and, and you may or may not model your, well, you, you'll explore your environment. You may or may not model it. You may have a model already that you're gonna work from. Um, it, this will influence the algorithms that you're going to try to define. You have the value function that you can work with as a way to find optimal policies because that's what you're always going after. And it could be dynamic programming, it could be Monte Carlo, it could be temporal difference learning that you're using uh, to get some type of value function. Uh, you typically will not be doing exhaustive search unless your space is really small. And then you might model your policy directly. You might do uh, policy search, uh, whether you use gradients or you don't use gradients. And then of course, why not just put the two together? And one of the key ones that is known in terms of algorithms that exists is your actor critic model. So if you haven't already kind of picked this up as I've been going along, some of the main challenges that we're up against with reinforcement learning is definitely around getting these models um, 
to converge, to come up with something useful. Also, if the reward is in this very complex environment to explore and it's hard to get to, uh, finding a way to accurately give some type of value for it. Uh, delayed rewards really lead to a hard, a real good, yeah, a good model to use. Exploration versus exploitation is a common challenge in terms of, you know, you have to make a decision in a hard call of like, at what point do you say this is good enough? Uh, or is there something I haven't explored fully here that would really be the best and, and even better option to go down? And generalization, transfer learning, how to take something you've built to solve a problem and use it in, for other problems, other similar problems. Uh, this is not easy to achieve. You know, there's definitely work in this space that's going on. Using models helps with this in terms of modeling the environment. Uh, if you think about, you know, like you had a robot that was learning to screw a bottle cap on a Coke or a Coke bottle, that you could potentially transfer that to screwing in a light bulb. Um, that helps when you have some type of model in the environment. Uh, but being able to do generalization, transfer of knowledge from what you've achieved with one model is very hard uh, and one that there's a lot of work to overcome. I've got a number of libraries, uh, or I've got a few of the libraries. There's many out there that um, you can explore for reinforcement learning. I've picked some of the ones from the, the larger well-known names that exist. Um, but I definitely recommend exploring what else you can find on GitHub especially. These are great for different reasons, and they give you, you know, data to work with and uh, environments to work in, uh, as well as predefined algorithms that you can easily kind of plug and run. And then I'm going to play this one other video that I like, uh, I think is, is a good kind of commentary on reinforcement learning. Highlights from Robocop 2017. And now, highlights from Robocop 2017, vastly improved by Univision Deportes commentator Luis Omar Tapia. El amarillo 4 quiere pasar el tremendo de dos volantes del equipo azul. ¿Quiere? ¿Puede? No, señor. La pelota que rebota y está dividida en la zona media. Ahora va a venir el pelotazo largo, pero el balón que vino de primera falta larga, falta larga, falta larga, falta larga, de conseguirla y de ventaja. El centro va a venir del borde del área, ya está a 5 para pegarle de sur, le va a venir el martillazo, le va a pegar gol. Okay, so outside of the fact that I find that one to be fun to watch, um, I uh, bring this one up in particular because uh, RoboCup, this has been around since the 90s. It was uh, defined, or it, was, it was this idea that was born by a professor who was trying to figure out an interesting way to engage people on the advances in the space. Um, and then Japan jumped on it and was like, let's make this a thing. And other researchers who are in other countries were like, we want in. So it started in 1997, so 20 years ago. And, you know, here we are, we're seeing, um, uh, we, we see an example from just this year, actually. And they're adorable. And I know you're like, oh, wow, you know, that's cute and all. Um, but of course, it's not going to be able to be a human. What's interesting is that the researchers in this space actually do want to do that. They want to achieve that. And that seems sort of almost fanciful in some ways, but yet not impossible. Reinforcement learning, it's, it's a hard uh, algorithmic space to be in. It has a lot of hype right now. And this is true about AI, deep learning, machine learning, all of it. But the hype has, it, the hype exists because we're seeing real world results from things. We're seeing them applied to problems and solving problems you wouldn't have expected to be solved. And then once we've solved those problems, it's sort of almost assumed, well, of course you solve those problems, but you're not going to solve the next problem. Uh, I, I caution, I always believe, and I, I, I really caution this with any of these spaces, and especially, you know, with reinforcement learning. It's important to have excitement. It's important to be inspired. It's also very important to be pragmatic. So to, to understand what you can achieve, yet also explore, you know? So always keep that in mind. Keep those two in balance when you're looking at this. I do believe we will get there. We will see these robots being hum beating humans at, at soccer, and that will be phenomenal. It's phenomenal to imagine right now. Uh, do I think that then they will like take over all our jobs and you know 
try to kill us all? No. Uh, that making anything uh, have that level of intelligence is far off way into the future, if ever. And so I, I think, though, that we can see some real advancements that are exciting, and that's what makes this space uh, interesting to be involved in. All right. Um, the last couple of things I want you to take away from this, the, one, the areas that really are resonating in terms of exploration or, or resonating in terms of what researchers are interested in trying to get uh, into and get farther down the path with, re with reinforcement learning are that exploration, exploitation uh, trade-off and transfer learning. Those are two of many, but two key ones that really matter in terms of seeing some success come out of reinforcement learning uh, that we have not fully been able to realize. The keys to really seeing this successful is being able to take the problem, to break it into smaller components, and ultimately to drive for an optimal policy. That is what you're trying to drive out. You always want to get the most reward, but to get there, you want to know what the best approach looks like. I've got some resources. I actually already have these slides on Twitter, and I will repost those just to make sure. But these are some resources I found that are great as a, a way to start out in the space. I had a number of images that I used, and I had some people who were very kind to spend their time with me to help me get this talk pulled together. That's primarily what I wanted to cover. As I mentioned, I uh, have some stuff that I saw in chat. I'll try to spend a few more minutes responding. Uh, but thank you very much for taking the time.